Hello and welcome to today's KDP Universities at Home with Beverly Jenkins. I'm Trisha, and for the past five years, I've moved around Amazon's book teams, learning the business so I can share it with authors. Prior to coming to Amazon, I worked as a graphic artist, project manager, and educator. Currently, I'm privileged to work with the KDP University team, helping authors use the KDP website to make the most of their author journey. But enough about me. We're here to speak to Beverly Jenkins, who is the USA Today best-selling author of over 49 published works and a national icon for historic romance. She specializes in African-American life. The NAACP Image Award nominee and recipient of the Romance Writers of America 2017 Nora Roberts Lifetime Achievement Award, Jenkins has been featured by many major media outlets, including the New York Times, People, Wall Street Journal, National Public Radio, and CBS. And on the year of the 25th anniversary of both her Vivid and Indigo books, we are happy to have Ms. Jenkins join us today. Welcome, Ms. Beverly. Thank you. How are you? I'm great. How are you doing? I am doing very, very well. Thanks for having me on. Oh, we are totally honored to have you with us this morning. Good. Well, let's get started on a little bit of history. When did you figure out that being an author was your calling? Um, you know, I told a story that I didn't, I hadn't planned to be an author, but I was the editor of my elementary school newspaper in the fourth grade. So when I was nine years old, um, did a little scribbling, you know, between now and then. And um, high school had a, one of my English teachers did an assignment, short stories. I turned a story in. She said, this is wonderful. She wanted to uh, submit it to a citywide contest. <clears throat> But you know, you're 15, you don't have any confidence. And I'm like, nah, nah, nah. So um, my goal was only libraries because books have always been my thing. So I sort of stumbled into this. So here I am 27 years later talking to you. <laughs> well, we are thrilled that you stumbled this way. Uh, your <laughs> books are amazing. You are an icon in the uh, historical fiction genre. Oh, thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah. I'm having a good time. You know, you get to, to get to do what 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 you love, which not a lot of people can do. So uh, mm -hmm. being a writer is kind of a it's having a blessed life. Uh, you can be in your pajamas all day and you know <laughs> hang out on social media and try and get your books in on time. You know, so yeah. well. So you write primarily in historical fiction, right? But right. very specifically, African American historical fiction. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. Um, because we you know we have such a deep rooted history here in the United States that mm -hmm. is not regularly taught, you know, in history classes. So there's a mm -hmm. lot of areas that I can bring to light. Um, in ways by using the historical fiction uh, model it can bring it to light in ways that is not boring or you know there's no test on friday um, you can uh take in the history and take in a great story at the same time so mm -hmm. uh, i call it edutainment entertainment and education Hey, I am all about the edutainment. I think that's what I, I've made my life around that. So I'm fully supporting yeah, that. Yeah, 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 yeah. What, um, so what kind of research are you, do you do before you publish and before you write? If it's a subject that I don't know a lot about, mm -hmm. then I'll do a deep dive sort of before I get started. And then if I'm writing and I run across something that is like, oh, I don't know a lot about this, or I need to know more about this, then I'll stop mm -hmm. what I'm doing and um, research that little piece and hope I don't get down in the, you know, in a rabbit hole and get lost for, you know, four or five hours because that, you know, right. that can happen. You get down there and you forget, why am I down here? You know, right. um, but um, 
when I started out, I used the library, public library, mm -hmm. um, because I didn't have the, the, the library that I have now. Nice. So I wanted to get it right. I wanted to use historians who looked at American history through the black gaze, the mm -hmm. African American gaze, um, like Dr. Benjamin Quarles and um, Dorothy Sterling and, and those folks um, to get a different perspective, um, people who were at, on the front lines. So mm -hmm. it's been a great career. It's been great sharing the history. Um, I'm on my, I think, fourth generation of readers. So um, they are sharing that history with, you know, their grandkids and mm -hmm. daughters who are now in college or daughters who have their own families. So mm -hmm. it's, it's been good. It's been good. Now, you started as a traditionally published author. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. 1994. Um, didn't really get into uh, self-publishing until recently. Mm -hmm. My agent has a, a self-publishing arm in her shop. And um, we took some of the backlist titles that I had the rights to and mm -hmm. reissued them under new covers. Um, and it's been very, very lucrative. So um, it's been a win-win for me, win-win for, you know, the royalty statements, win-win for her because they're learning uh, as they go along also. So right. um, like I said, we're having a good time. Good. Now, did you rebrand any of your um, books, the backlist books, once you got the rights back to it and republished in the self-publishing? I, did. I didn't. I, I, I used, you know, I think with my books and, and with social media, mm -hmm. I think that people are discovering backlists all the time. Right. And I didn't want... I didn't change the titles because I didn't want my readers to rebuy things that they already have. Because readers can get upset about that. You know, they, they buy a right, book and I'm yeah. like, oh, wait, 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 wait. I, you just changed the title. This is a book I read, you know, 10 years ago. So I didn't rebrand the title. We just rebranded the covers. Um, because I have readers who collect the covers. So right. they've got, you know, three or four different versions of the same book. Um, and they don't mind buying it if it has a, a different cover. But no, we didn't rebrand. Um, we didn't rebrand the books. We just did the covers. We did the covers. Gotcha. Did you mm -hmm. go back um, into the with the historical fiction? I don't know how relevant this would be, but did you ever go back into the interior and do any updates to the content itself? <clears throat> nope. Uh -uh. Nope. Um, I'm pretty content with what I write. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, of course, there are books that you're like, you know, I wish I had done this or I should have done that. But you know, I don't believe in, in, in going back and fixing stuff. Right. Um, just take that information and, you know, hope to do better with your mm -hmm. next book. But um, yeah. Now, do you write in um a specific world or um, is it a do you write in series? I have a few <clears throat> and most of my books were standalones. Uh -huh. um, and then romance started this series thing and uh, everybody wanted a series. So my readers are going back. Okay, we have a Beverly Jenkins trivia question. There's only one book out of the 40, whatever, that is not connected. And I'm not going to give you the answer because, you know, it's a shameless plug to go out and buy my books so that you'll know <laughs> what the answer is. But the readers started putting them in series, books that were connected, that were written as standalones for me. <clears throat> so when I tell people to read the books, I tell them to read them uh, in publication order. That way they don't uh -huh. miss anything. But lately, romance has been, you know, focusing on these, on these series. So um, I have done two or three or four, um, what you could call series. Right. 
Yeah, so we've got the Old West series, we've got the Destiny series, um, we have the Women Who Dare series, and I always write very, very strong heroines, and they're always mm -hmm. daring this or that. So when we came to this last series, we're like, okay, we'll call it Women Who Dare. You always dare anyway, so let's, you know, just, just, we'll call it that. Um, but, you know, it's, you know, I think that, that readers love the connecting stories. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you try and give the readers what they want, but also writing what you want to write because you can't really write to trend, at least I try not to. Uh, some people do that well. I'm like, no, nope, that's not what I'm writing this time. So um, trying to keep everybody happy and me. There you go. How much of a balance is that? How much of, where do you draw the line to say, um, I want to keep my readers happy, but this is where it's no longer me. You know, how yeah. do you draw that line? Because that's a fine balance. If I don't know enough about that back, that, that side character's backstory, then I'm mm -hmm. not going to write the story. Um, with Wild Rain um, that was published in February, uh, she had made an appearance in the book before that in Tempest. And she was so intriguing. I mean, everywhere I went when I toured, everybody wanted to know, you know, is she going to get a book? Is she going to get a book? Is she going to get a book? And I was fascinated by her too. So I was like the readers. I was like, let's give her a book so we can find out, you know, exactly who she is and, and all of that. But sometimes um, readers will ask for stories and I'm like, hmm, I love you, but no, you know, I don't know enough about, or I don't have any interest in, in mm -hmm. bringing that, that character story forward. So, so you, like you say, you try to keep it balanced, but mm -hmm. usually they, they love what, you know, whatever I, I give them, I keep them in mind. I try and not give them the same story every time. Right. Uh, different characters, different settings, most of the 19th century, though. Um, mm -hmm. But um, maybe a Western one time or uh, a period piece next time or something during Reconstruction next time. Or, so that that's a balance, too, is to try not to use the same setup. Or the uh -huh. same backdrop. Um, I look at my books as painting sometimes, and you know, I've got the characters and I'm trying and the and the scenes and the description and stuff in the back that I'm painting uh -huh. on. So I try not to give them the same background for each painting because uh, you know, variety right. is good. Variety is good. It is. It is. Mm -hmm. So you started as a traditionally published author and you've moved over to self-publishing with some of your backlist. What's the difference between the two? What's the biggest difference that you've seen? The biggest difference that I've seen so far is, you know, because you know, you've got bills to pay, um, right. is the royalty uh, foundation, the royalty format. Because traditionally you get paid twice a year. Uh -huh. um, I get paid in April and, and October, depending on which big five is paying me. Um, and then with self-publishing, you know, you get a check every, every, every month. And that helps a little bit, you know, better to, you know, to balance stuff, to, to, you know, invest or whatever you're going to do with, with your cash. Mm -hmm. Um, so for me, that's the biggest difference. Um, you know, I haven't gotten very, very deep into self-publishing yet to, to find out, you know, if there are any other advantages or disadvantages. Uh -huh. um, so I think each model has its own advantages and its own disadvantages. Right. So right. If, if we can find um, the best of both worlds, I think uh, things work a lot better that way. Now, um, you have an agent that you work with, mm -hmm. right? Can you tell yeah. me about that experience? What is that relationship like? You know, what does your agent do for you versus what, you know, some an author without an agent would deal well, with? Um, having an agent for me yes. allows me to concentrate just on writing. Um, she and I have been together almost 30 years now. Um, we both started when we were like 12. 
Um, <laughs> I was going to say, you look fantastic for being in the industry for 30 years. So you had to have. I think that 15 yeah. is when you started, right? <laughs> yeah, I was 15 when I started. Um, and she's just incredible. Mm -hmm. I mean, she has, you know, not just for me, but for all of her authors. So she's got a, a pretty good size uh, agency with some pretty well-known uh, popular authors. Mm -hmm. And she does her best to try and put us in whatever platform will get us seen. Mm -hmm. she, we're all, I think, very, very excellent writers. Um, and with, you know, the, the world expanding and you've got places like Radish and you've got places like Amazon and you've got, you know, places like Chapters and all of that, she makes a point to try and see if her people will fit, where we will fit in this, you know, new and exciting, brave new world. Right. Um, I don't want to negotiate contracts. You know, she does that. You know, all I, you know, I'm lazy. All I want to do is write. You know, I don't want to have to worry about, you know, distribution or, you know, I, I do, you know, get, and I think you do that both with traditional and with uh, self-publishing. You know, I do want to know what's on the cover, you know, and, and I'm blessed to have a, a traditional publisher that will run stuff by me before. But I could not have been, and when I started, you, you, you couldn't do this without an agent. Mm -hmm. you know, there was no self publishing when I started. Right. So um, I am blessed to have her in my life. She works really hard. Um, she earns that 15%. I do not mind paying that because what I get in return is, is, is priceless. Right. So um, I couldn't do this without my agent. And some people work well without an agent. Uh -huh. uh, one of the joys of, 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 of writing is that everybody has their own uh, platform. Everybody has their right. own way of dealing with their careers. And right. those who can do without an agent, you know, seem to be doing fine. But me, like I said, I'm lazy. You know, I just want to write. I don't want to have to be calling people and, you know, running down this and dealing with that and dealing with that. You know, I just let, you know, my agent do that. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now. But you do some of the marketing because you have a very active social media presence. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, it was a mid list for a long time. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you when you're a mid list, it's, marketing is sort of your bailiwick. You know, you got to get out there and, and sell those books. Um, I have never met a stranger. <laughs> so... The connections that I have made over these 27 years has been very, very vital to my writing mm -hmm. because it helps with word, you know, word of mouth and people are saying, you know, you need to read Miss Bab. Um, I have three, three Facebook pages, three Facebook pages. Um, I have a. In those three pages, I also have a spoiler room uh -huh. because um, if a book drops at midnight, hits their Kindle at midnight, somebody wants to, you know, talk about that book at six o'clock that next morning because they have been right. up all night. They've been held that book. But, you know, there are a lot of people who you know don't read that quickly or they have a job they're doing or, you know, so rather than have the story spoiled by somebody coming on the the page and going, oh my God, and da 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 da. I give them their own room, and they can go in, and they can talk about the book with other people who have also read the book. So you try and give your readers what they need uh -huh. in order to support you. Um, I say good morning to them every morning, and I wave good night and throw them kisses every night before I go to bed. They're going to bed. I'm usually working at night. But the social media thing is very, very important, and it sells books. In fact, mm -hmm. we had a conversation on Twitter a couple of days ago um, because there are people who believe that, you know, social media and, and Twitter um, in particular does not sell books. But if all you're going to do is slap your link 
two years self-published or you're traditionally published and then expect to make a million dollars and you have no kind of you know engagement you're not going to sell books right so we were talking about you know it takes conversation and engagement and because mm-hmm. we you know we on on twitter we call uh, romance twitter is called romance landia and we don't spend time talking about our books all the time you know we may be talking about somebody's kids or or, or we may be talking about you know who knows what we're talking about we, you know one night we spent all night talking about sharks so <laughs> that kind of engagement lets people come in and say what are those people doing you know mm-hmm. and, and they'll start to follow you um you shouldn't and, and then somebody put up the other day uh rules and regulations about people begging for followers and i mean that does is turn people off so you try and so basically what this long-winded answer is about is connect with people find mm-hmm. a way to connect with readers and it doesn't necessarily mean slapping your books and buy my book every day buy my book every day nobody wants to see that they want to know mm-hmm. who you are you know and you and because it's your page and it's your platform you get to um, allow them to see as much of you as you are comfortable with. Um, me, my readers know all my business, you know, because I, I just, you know. You <laughs> read my mind, that was gonna be my next question. <laughs> you know, I, you know, I, mm, you know, and I lost my husband in 03 to cancer. Mm-hmm. And no matter how hard that day was, and dealing with, you know, his illness. Mm-hmm. I knew that at night I could log on and those women were there for me. Mm-hmm. Um, I could not have gone through that without them. Right. So that's the kind of bond, you know, I don't know if you want to get into it that deeply, but yeah. um, it, their support of me as a person meant you know so so very much mm-hmm. so like i said it's up to you about how much you want to expose yourself to your readers but if they see you as a person and not just you know the person that's supplying the book that they're going to read tonight mm-hmm. um, you have a better chance of hooking them to follow right. you for 27 years through you know, all the genres, because I, you know, I started out writing historicals and then I branched off into contemporary and I have mm-hmm. two young adults and now I have women's fiction. Um, but they would follow me to the sun, I think, if I asked them. And that's, that's a blessing. You know, I t- you know, I told them when I count my blessings, I count them twice because you know, they are I mean, they've helped me pay my mortgage. They've helped put my kids through school. You know, they helped me buy my six-speed Honda. I mean, all of the things that, you know, bring me comfort into my life have come through the readers and their support of me and my books. And that, I think, is the kind of relationship that I mm-hmm. want. You know, right. everybody's different. Everybody's different. So, so that's but my But I think that story. that's... Yeah, I think that that's an excellent point is building that relationship. Mm-hmm. It, the days of, you know, just having putting a book out there and having people use their imagination to understand who the author is, it, it's gone. You yeah. really have to build that relationship with your your readers. Yeah. And I think that you do that well and you do that by being genuine. Yeah, yeah. They they, they can tell if you're faking it. Yeah. Um, you know, Back before, you know, back when the earth was cooling, when we had, you know, lots of bookstores and, you know, before, you know, social media, um, the only way you could connect through to readers, mm-hmm. you go to signings, you'd have a notebook, you'd have them put their address in the notebook, um, and you would mail people stuff. You know, mm-hmm. you'd mail your newsletter or you mail announcements, that kind of thing. Um, this way is so much easier. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, you can, I don't, some people schedule posts, I don't do that. Um, but you can reach out and touch a whole lot more people now mm-hmm. than you could back in, back in the day. Um, 
Mm-hmm. And you have to come up with something different because, like, you know, there's not a lot of bookstores now. Right. Very few signs. Um, so I'm just trying to keep up, you know. I was, I'm just trying to keep up. Well, you, you seem to be doing an excellent job keeping up. I'm trying. I'm trying. So we have um, some questions that have come in, and I want to make sure that we get to some of these. And we have a question about, have you ever had or published a book that totally missed the mark and didn't sell well? And then what did you, nope, never had that happen to you. No, I mean, and you can't, the only thing you can really control is uh-huh. what you write. Yeah, you can't control sales. You can't control marketing. You can't control distribution. Um, all you can do. The only thing you can control is what you write and mm-hmm. hope to have a platform or a foundation where the book does what it's going to do. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I, and, you know, and you can't worry about that. Now, all you can uh-huh. worry about is writing the best book that you can and go with that. So let's talk about writing the best book. We've got a few questions that have come in about what is your process for writing and then who's your edit who does your editing okay i am a pantser um and for those who don't know what that is you have plotters who sit down and they will plot out you know my girlfriend betty ford is, is a writer um and she's been out here as long as i have betty knows the very first word that's going to go on her book and she knows the very last word that's going to go on her book me no um, if I have to sit down and plot and plan and outline, for me, that takes all the energy out of the book and I'm ready to go to the next book. Uh-huh. Uh, pants is right by the seat of their pants. A lot of times we have no idea what's going to happen in the book. A very organic kind of um, experience. It's sort of like <laughs> walking across the Grand Canyon on a tightrope with no net. Um, and plotters, a lot of plotters, because we have these conversations all the time uh, in Romance Landia, um, they're terrified by that mm-hmm. um, because that's not the way that they write. Me, you know, I, I, I always tell people, you know, when I start a book, you know, I may have a kernel of a story, I may have a kernel of a character. Um, and then I'm wandering around like, you know, Moses in the in the in the desert, in the wilderness for like two weeks trying to figure out, you know, how do I get to the promised land from here to there? But usually, you know, the characters in my world, the characters know the story. I don't. Mm-hmm. And I've said in other interviews that I feel like they're sitting in the in one of the corners of my office laughing at me because they know the story and I don't. And they'll feed me little pieces and, you know, give me little kernels of this or little kernels of that. And lo and behold, at the end of the book, you know, I got a real book. But we all do it differently. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm a, I'm a write, I write at night because when I started, you know, I had a husband, I had two kids, I had a job, I had a brownie troop. Um, you know, all of the things that, you know, a, a suburban mom gets involved in church and community hats that I was wearing. So the only time I could really write was at night. Um, And now that the kids and kids are grown and gone and hubby's in heaven playing golf, um, (laughs) I've got the house to myself, which is kind of cool. But I still write at night. You know, I'm Mm -hmm. still writing at night because my brain doesn't turn on, I guess, because of all those years of writing at night. Yeah. So, so find your process. You know, don't try and copy somebody else's process. Mm-hmm. Write how you want to write. And being a mom with kids, you got to find the time to write. Um, I remember editing books, you know, sitting in a car waiting for band practice to get over. Both my kids mm-hmm. were marching band. So here I am at night, you know, in the park a lot under the big lights on the football field, you know, trying to edit. And editors, my editors are supplied by my publisher. Uh And I have been blessed to have absolutely fabulous editors. Because with your editor, I mean, it's a partnership. Mm -hmm. And your 
team's goal is to try to put out the best book possible. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I run into a lot of um, people who are traditionally published or who want to be traditionally published or, or want to be self-published. I said, well, I don't need an editor. You need an editor. I'm going to tell you right now, you need an editor. Um, I need an editor because I got a tendency to put like a thousand people in the books. And my editor's like, why is this person in this book? And I'm like, I don't know. You know, it just seemed like a good idea. <laughs> you know? They just showed up. <laughs> just showed up, showed up, wants to be in the book. You need an editor because sometimes we're too close to the story that we can't see uh, the forest for the trees. Mm-hmm. And one of the um, best pieces of advice that I have ever gotten and that she continues to give me because I've been with this editor almost 12 years, 15 years, something like that. She was eight when she started. Uh, she always tells me, dig deeper. You know, dig deeper, dig deeper within this character. So now, because I hear her in my head when I'm when I'm writing, you know, I, I and say, okay, Erica's gonna tell me dig deeper. So let me do that now. Um, but you should have a great relationship with your editor. And I know that some people don't. You know, some people, you know, they mm, sometimes they don't click. Mm-hmm. But even if you don't click personality wise, um, that editor hopefully will make your book better. But you mm-hmm. need an editor. Anybody out there that thinks they don't need, you need an editor and not your cousin and not, you know, Ray Ray down the street or, you know, your, your mom's girlfriend, get you a real editor, somebody that knows what they're doing. Somebody's gonna tell you the truth, you know, cause your mother's gonna say, oh honey, this is, this is wonderful. You know, and it's mm-hmm. not, you know, she's, she's your mom. She's supposed to say, it's wonderful. Get mm-hmm. an editor, get a real editor. So that's my advice. <laughs> All right. Um, what kind of promotion happens when you launch a, a title? Do you, how much of it do you put on social media or do you, what other promotions do you do? I do. Um, when I get the cover art, uh, I do a cover review mm-hmm. on my Facebook pages and on my Twitter. I don't do Instagram or any of that. You know, I'm 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 wasting enough time with Facebook and Twitter, so I don't really need to be on Instagram or any of that. Um, uh-huh. And then when the the book comes up uh, available for pre-order, I will do pre-order links along with the cover. So when mm-hmm. you are, for those who are, you know, just starting out with this, when your book is ready, don't just put the cover up. I mean, you can put the cover up, but as soon as mm-hmm. that link, that pre-order link comes up, put that up along with the cover, hit all of the retailers. So because people buy, you know, use different devices, people use different vendors mm-hmm. um so people will know that your book is out there so then i don't do anything else with it until maybe i may put it up again a month before it goes live mm-hmm. and then i'll put it up again uh maybe two weeks before it goes live and then the week before i'll put it up again mm-hmm. um, i always tell my my readers, um, you know, it, buy the book that first week. You know, even if you're not going to uh, read it, buy it that mm-hmm. first week because that helps your favorite author make lists. Whether it's New York Times, whether it's you know Amazon, whether it's Publishers Weekly, you know, whether it's New York Times, um, because I don't think author readers knew they didn't know that. So uh-huh. we try, we're trying to push that with, with our readers these days. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I mean, and depending on your platform, um, it's a good way to get, get word out there. I I'll open my page to just about anybody in romance who wants to share their stuff. 
Right. Because you don't have a huge platform. I mean, there's people out there that got millions and millions and millions of followers. <laughs> you know, mm, I don't have that many. But the platform that I have is fairly okay size wise. Uh-huh. So it it I'm into sharing. I'm into trying to make the path wider. So um, when newbies or you know people who don't have a huge platform, you know, I always tell them, you know. Hit me up on Twitter. I will retweet. I will, you know, because you want to be kind. Mm-hmm. Be kind as opposed to, you know, sometimes kind as opposed to right. Um, yeah. And it, it get, builds up a lot of goodwill and it helps people sell books. It so I mean, that's what we're in the business for, selling books. So it's um, a, go ahead. It's a community. And, and supporting and lifting up other people just yeah. makes that community wider. It does. I think that's one of the great things about the romance community. You know, sometimes it's not about love, you know, but, you know, because we have our issues, too. But we are very, very supportive of each other mm-hmm. in, in, in books and, and, and our bloggers and um, our, our reviewers. Uh, we try and work as one unit all pulling in the same direction. Sometimes the wheels come off, but um, yeah, <laughs> we don't go I think that, that happens everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but, I, but I think we, we, we sort of got it down to a science. Um, so, you know, there are, you know, lots of ways to, to promote um, and you figure out what works for you because uh-huh. we all come to the table with something different. Agreed. Um, there are several people who are asking for your social media handles. If you want to give those out, I can have Maria, who's doing a fantastic job answering questions, okay. share that with everyone. Um, website is BeverlyJenkins.net. Uh, Facebook, just put Facebook and put my name in and it'll come up. And Twitter is at author Miss Bev. Author M-S-B-E-V. Perfect. Okay. All right. And then Maria will send those out as a chat to everyone so they'll have it. Thank you, Maria. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's see what else we have. Um, we've had a couple people asking, what is your best tip for new writers? Finish the book. There you go. Well <laughs> said. <laughs> because, you know, we... We spend a lot of time talking about the book. I remember when I was writing my first book, and I wasn't even writing for publication. I was just sitting there writing for myself. Um, I've got four sisters. And they were like, well, how is the book doing? You know, so stop talking about it. Write the book, finish the book. And that first draft, you want to finish that first draft. Because it gives you a sense of accomplishment. You finished it. Hallelujah, pat yourself on the back, you know, do the happy dance. And then go back and start actually writing the book. Um, Don't ever send your first draft to anybody, please. First drafts are crap. They're supposed to be. Uh, Your first draft is just there to figure out what sticks to the wall. Mm -hmm. So that first draft, don't worry about grammar, don't worry about plot, don't worry about characterization. All you want to do is finish it. And then you go back and fix those characters and, and fix that that plot and and do your grammar. And remember that books have three parts, the beginning, the middle, and the end. It's sort of like a sandwich. You know, two pieces of bread on the on the each side and the and the meat's in the middle. And that's the hardest part of the book for me to write, is the middle. Um, because things can sort of you know, slow down and but that's the most important part of your story is is what's happening in the middle. So so finish the book. Don't send your first draft to anybody because and please don't publish it. You know, don't publish that first draft. Lord have mercy. Save us. Save your readers. Save your save your reputation. Um and do the work that you need to do. There are no shortcuts to this. There are no magic tickets. You know, this is not Charlie's 
Willy Wonka's Chocolate Factory. There are no go tickets. It's just hard work. And don't let anybody tell you that there is a way to do this. If you can't write it every day, that's okay. People got kids, you know, people got sick pets, people got jobs and working overtime. But you, you try and, and, and put as much in time into it as you can. So mm -hmm. lots of tips. <laughs> so your your middle, you talked about it. Those are fantastic tips, but that, that middle part, the pacing, I, we get a lot of questions around pacing. How yeah. do you figure out your pacing for your books? I just write the story. You know, I and and then I go back and and say, okay, I read it as a reader. Uh -huh. When I edit, I edit as a reader. Because when you edit as an author, you sort of miss stuff. Right. Print everything out. I never edit on screen. <clears throat> I always print stuff out because that way I can read it as a reader. Right. Okay. And in that way, I can sort of see what needs fixing. You mm -hmm. know, is it too slow? Did this happen too quickly? Um, and I use my experience as a reader. Mm -hmm. To critique what I've, read, what I've written. That's what works for me. Um, I think people get hung up on the idea of writing a book. Mm -hmm. um, tell yourself the story. Sometimes that frees you from being frozen within the constraints of, I'm writing a book, oh my God. You know, tell yourself the story. Um, have fun with it. And Lord, don't take yourself seriously. I mean, we're just writing. We're not doing brain surgery here, you know. Um, but I think if sometimes if you just slow down, mm -hmm. it's one of the best pieces of advice that my editor, I mean, my agent gave me. But she used to be an editor also. Slow the story down. Mm -hmm. Slow things down. Don't try and write everything so quickly. You know, because you, you miss stuff that you can put in there to help that word count. Um, so I don't know, that's, I could talk about this stuff all day. I mean, we could be here till Tuesday. Um, I'm fine with that. I'm <laughs> enjoy, I, I love talking to you. We had, we had so much fun the other day getting to know each other and yeah, even did. more fun today. So we'll just hang out for the rest of the day. How's that? That sounds good. All right. <laughs> so hopefully right. that answered that, that question about, I did. okay. Mm -hmm. What else you got for me, my dear? We have a couple questions about love scenes. So okay. how do you write love scenes that you don't feel embarrassed about writing? If you're embarrassed about writing it, you should be writing it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, we romance writers have no shame in that. Um, right. But they are difficult for some more, sometimes they are difficult for people. Just uh -huh. do it organically. Let them do what they're gonna do. Mm -hmm. um, there is no set formula on how to do it. Read some romance. That'll help. Yes. Um, we do it very, very well. Um, and it, and is a love scene necessary in the story? Right. I mean, you don't, don't throw it in there just because you think everybody wants to read a romance or everybody uh -huh. wants to read a love scene. Because we have lots of romances that have no love scenes. Right. Okay. Um, so number one, ask yourself, is it really needed? Mm -hmm. And then number two, you know, I don't want to tell you people, think about you in bed. <laughs> right. <laughs> How's that going? <laughs> you know, um, each character that I've written or each couple. I mean, they bring their own stuff mm -hmm. to the scenes. I try not to limit them. I try not to get in the way. Um, my characters are very, very alive to me. Mm -hmm. So when they're doing, whether they're, you know, in bed or whether they're at the dinner table, mm -hmm. um, let that character lead you where you need to go. Um, mm -hmm. 
I don't know. I mean, there, there's no set. I mean, it used to be back in the day, we had to write 10 pages. Love scenes were 10 pages. Uh -huh. um, and that's a slog, boy. Wow. Trying to, you know, keep keep it going for 10 pages. Now, you know, there's 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 no, you know, set kind of formula on that. But, mm -hmm. you know, is it necessary? And if you're embarrassed about it, I don't know what to tell you. I mean, <laughs> because... Um, read some romance because uh, we have all levels of of heat and i think people right. don't understand, and i think people don't understand that that yeah there are all different levels mm -hmm. uh, there's a sweetness there's an erotica there's you know and everything in between mm -hmm. so read some romance to see how i don't want to call us experts but we are uh the yeah. experts do it and and take your tips from there right. um, I'm, I'm not trying to belittle you, but you know, do some do some romance. Romance will not give you the cooties. Uh, it will help you with emotions. It will help you with connections between characters, mm -hmm. because that's what we write. It's we don't. It's not all about the, the love scenes. You know, it's about right. the connections of of people and the emotion of being in a relationship. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and to your point, there's there's all sorts. I mean, there's the fade to black, you know, yeah. they go to bed and it's the next morning. There's that's yeah. perfectly acceptable in the genre. Yeah. Right. Perfectly acceptable anywhere, you know? Right. So yep. you know, you have to determine, you know, your level of comfort and does this story mm -hmm. really need, you know, right. two people playing the two bag beast, as right. Shakespeare calls it. So, you know. There you go. There you go. My morning is complete. Beverly Jenkins has now quoted Shakespeare for me. We do that all the all time. Right. Romance Landia. There you go. Yeah. I now have to go check out Romance Landia. I haven't spent yeah. enough time there, apparently. Oh, we have a ball. We have a ball. How long does it take you to write, edit, and publish a book? I do two books a year. Mm -hmm. um, so let's say six months apiece. Um, sometimes I'm late, but um, the process, I'll finish. It usually takes about eight months to go from my computer after I send it into my editor to, mm -hmm. to sales. Um, it's a quicker thing for self-publishing, but yeah. um, traditional publishing has lots of moving parts. Mm -hmm. um, so. When I turn that first, what would be my first draft, which would be, you know, five drafts in or whatever, um, mm -hmm. I get a, a revision letter. And my editor will tell me the parts that she loved, the parts that like, mm, you know, the parts that she thinks I need to dig, dig deeper, as I mm -hmm. mentioned earlier. And it may maybe anywhere from two weeks to a month before I get that revision letter back, which gives me mm -hmm. time to breathe. Cause you know, I haven't been sleeping and haven't been eating, haven't been showering and all of that, trying to make the deadline. Right. So the revision letter comes back. Um, they tell you, you know, don't, I mean, read it and put it away. Don't react. Cause a lot of times, especially when you start, when you're new, you look at the revision letter and you're like, I won't do an edit. She doesn't know what she's talking about. You know, just craziness. Mm -hmm. So put it away. Bring it out a couple of days later and look at it objectively. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times you realize that the editor actually knows what he or she is doing. So you fix that. You send it in. And uh, then, depending on your contract, you get paid your right. second half of your advance and so then it goes into production and you're saying hallelujah because by then i'm so sick of this couple you know it's like okay <laughs> put them in a backboard a bug board send them into the canyon they're dead the end right <laughs> so you don't see it again <laughs> for another maybe eight weeks mm -hmm. And their first pass pages, which you're looking for typos, you're looking, oh, copy editor in between. Okay, mm -hmm. after I send it in, then the copy editor gets it. And they're looking for um, typos, they're looking for continuity, they're looking to make sure that the names are the same, because um, I, I, I blow that a lot. 
you know, I'll have a character in a series. The character in a series of book one and book two has got a totally different name. And my readers are like, who the hell is this? You know, so. <laughs> you know, from book one. Right. And they're like, Miss Babby wasn't in book one. Luckily, and I'm on the side here, uh, there's a woman on uh, Twitter named mm -hmm. Lily who does book Bibles. And what she will do is go through your series and she'll write down all the names, mm -hmm. all the places, all of the events, put them in a Word document or on a spreadsheet. She'll charge you, of course. She's got a reasonable fee. Um, mm -hmm. And send it to you. My Blessing series has 11 books. My book Bible so far is 48 pages. But you have to use it. You know, you have to use it. <laughs> So, so for those of you out there who have series um, and you're having issues with, you know, trying to keep everybody straight and all that, look up Lily in Romance Land. If she's, if she's got an open spot, um, and I'm sure that there are other people, but she's the only one that I know. Uh, Kit right. Roker, uh recommended me, recommended her to me. So, so anyway, so copy editor comes after my final. Um, revision. Uh -huh. Like I said, you're looking for names and continuity and, and stuff. And then it comes back to you and you either agree with what the copy editor has said because sometimes they think they're the main editor. No. Mm -hmm. um, uh, what did uh, Elmore Leonard said? You have to remember that copy editors have no power. Um, <laughs> but you want to <laughs> Because usually copy editors are freelancers. Right. They, are, they aren't usually, you know, traditionally with on the traditional publishing staff. Mm -hmm. So, but you look at stuff like, I mean, of course, you want to pay attention to the little things like names and continuity and, and all of that. But when they start trying to swap sentences and all of that, then, you know, you're like, mm, that's not your job. Right. I, okay, example. <laughs> I had a sentence in one of my blessings books where somebody wanted, it was a secret. So they'll say, okay, let's keep this on the down low, right? Mm -hmm. The copy editor sent me back and said, poor grammar. It should say, put it on the low shelf. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Thank That's you for your suggestion. That's not what Dalo means, you know. <laughs> so that was one of those things where the Elmore Leonard quote came to my head. And it's like, <laughs> no. Thank you for your suggestion. But thank you for your time, you know. <laughs> so, so okay, it's copy editor. Send it back. Then I don't mm -hmm. get it another uh, look at it until um, the last run through. And I'm looking for typos. And anything that I may need to add that's essential to the story that I may have forgotten in the other uh, mm -hmm. drafts will go in there at that time. And then I don't see it again until it's on the show. So that takes about eight months after I finish wow. it. So, so like I said, okay. it's, a, it's, a, it's a more elongated process than it is right. for self-publishing. Right. Self-publishing turnarounds a little quicker. Yeah. All right, we have time for one more question. Amazingly, oh, this God. hour is almost up. Where did the hour go, Trish? I don't know. It's like this and it's all over. I know. Right. So the last question we have, and I think that everybody has this question when they're just getting started. How do you handle negative reviews from readers? Don't read them. Reviews are for readers. They're not for authors. Yes. So don't be on Goodreads making your giving yourself a heart attack don't read them yeah. that is the best advice because i mean we we have this conversation all the time online right. because mm -hmm. people are tagging the authors with negative reviews right. and don't tag you know it's like stop Reviews are for readers. They're not for authors. So right. if you can sit on your hands and not click on the reader reviews, 
you'll be fine. Um, right. If you want to read them, you can go ahead and do that and make yourself crazy and, you know, weep in your beer and all of that. But they're not for you. <clears throat> they're for readers. Mm -hmm. um, you hope that, you know, the book is 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 good enough where even if you do get a negative review, the, the, the good ones are will outweigh it. But technically, they're not for you. They're for readers. Right. I think that's the best perspective. Um, I, that's honestly, I'm, I'm surprised I haven't heard that before, but that's brilliant that it's not. It's not for you. It's for other readers to find out if it's something that they're interested in. Right. And, you know, and, and, and we talk about this all the time. You know, someone will say, oh, it had too much sex in it. Everybody say, oh, click. You know, for those who want more love <laughs> safe. So exactly. Next, Thank you very much. Next, a negative review may bring somebody to the table for your book who mm -hmm. loves whatever the negative stuff was. Right. So, you know, don't, don't, don't sweat those little things. Yeah. Uh, you're supposed to be writing on the, on the next book anyway. Yeah. Right. You don't write the first book and then just go, you know, you're not going to be able to buy Escalade or any of that. Well, you might, but, you know, your job is to write that second book because you're trying to build a career. Uh -huh. so don't worry about what's happening on Goodreads or, you know, the crazy person on Amazon who doesn't like the sex in your books, because there's going to be somebody who will like the sex in your book and they're going to balance out, you know, so, yeah. Right. Well, thank you so much for that. I love that. Um, all right. We are, we are at time. We have just enough time. I want to give you an opportunity to give your social media handles again so okay. that everybody can follow up on this conversation. Yeah. Facebook, Beverly Jenkins. Just Google. Um, Twitter, at Ms. Bev. So the little, what is that, an ampersand? Uh, M-S-B-E-V. Website is beverlyjenkins.net. And that's it, because I'm, like I said, I'm not on Instagram or yep. any of that other craziness. So, um, but well, I think it's, go ahead. If you have three Facebook pages, I'm I'm surprised you can do anything else. <laughs> so is my editor. <laughs> oh, All Lord. right. On that note, happy publishing, everyone. <laughs>